work. Firstly, um, my name is John Ryan. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm here to talk about Islington's trees, um, a bit on the history and how I've used um, mapping to look at the history of trees in Islington, um, a bit on where we are at the moment, what we do in Islington, and then a little bit on what we hope to do in the future. Um, and that should hopefully tie into Kenton's talk um, at the end. Um, a bit about me, I'm the arboricultural manager. I've been there for three years as the manager, but before that I was the tree officer in planning in Islington. Um, I've been involved with trees for over 30 years now. Um, first as, as a tree surgeon working in the UK, in Germany, did some woodland management in Portugal, moved around a bit, came back to London, managed a big tree surgery company in London, and then, then gave up with tree surgery and decided to join the forces of good and light and become a tree officer. Um, I'm on the executive committee of the LTOA, the London Tree Officers Association, and I chair their planning working party and speak at national tree officer conferences and steering groups, along with Mac and Andy Allison, who I'm sure you're very aware of. Islington, right, okay, where is it? And uh, why, am I, why am I telling you about it? Well, Islington is in London, which, as you know, is the little dot at the bottom of the map there with the uh, over entitled sense of importance some would say but um and if you look here it's the green dark green blob in the center now isn't since london's divided up into separate boroughs managed by individual local governments uh, much like birmingham our budgets are set uh, and your areas set locally as well as nationally and um yeah so we're just north of this wiggly line that those of you who watch these standards will recognize as the thames it doesn't get much more urban central london um, than us so let's see it it's broken down into wards um, each of those wards three ward councillors it's very small um, it's only 15 square kilometers or five square miles um, but it's um, there's 250,000 people crammed in there and we think about the same number of trees as well which is good going but to give you a bit of size of um, sense of scale I don't know if you can see the little oval in the middle there that's the Emirates Football Club so that's a football pitch um, uh, our largest park, not much bigger than three or four football pitches. So it's, um, yeah, very dense. It looks like this. Uh, we've got some very affluent urban areas, um, some very dense areas of uh, social housing, one park, and believe it or not, that building actually looks like that. It was designed like that. I know it looks like the photo's been twisted or warped or something, but where we come, we've got a boundary with the city of London. So we've got a lot of high rises, extremely dense, uh, uh, hard surfacing, no trees on that picture, which is a great shame. We've also got a lot of history in the south of the borough as well. We have Charter House and yeah, there's a historical um, medieval road layout, which doesn't really suit um, tree planting. Uh, let me move on. So um, I had a quick look at the history of the trees in Islington for, um, for my own benefit, but also I, I uh, wanted to know more about how we got to where we were. And I chose to look at the historic maps um, uh, as an evidence base uh, for looking at the trees. But I am aware that there's not too many contemporaneous maps going back towards the last ice age or the, or the, or the Bronze Age. We, we, so a lot of it's um, uh, guesswork. Um, so, and I'm also going to have to move through 6,000 years in about 10 minutes. So it does go quite quickly. It does get more interesting once we get into the contemporaneous maps from uh, the sort of 16th century onwards. Um, Post-glacial to Bronze Age. By the time we get to the Bronze Age, all the trees in what is now Islington and in North London were being managed. Um, and it, they formed part of something that was now called the Forest of Middlesex, which is no longer there. Um, it was... Uh, a, a woodland that stretched for about 20 miles, but the best estimates that it was only about 40% canopy cover. So it's not closed canopy woodland, it's more forest with open space, um, grazing, rides, but it would have been managed. Um, we get to the establishment of uh, Roman Londinium and Islington is just to the north as Moorfields, Barbican, Islington just starts just up here. And at this stage, you know, Roman London demanded large quantities of the timber um, uh, and they would have been supplied by the surrounding woods and forests. I mean, a lot of people talk about the Iron Age and the Bronze Age. All through that, it was a wood age. Um, and I think so there's a couple of books coming out quite soon on how we don't have 
the history or the archaeology of the wood, but how important woods were at that point. Uh, in Islington, the archaeology is we, we found a lot of pottery kilns and stuff from around that time. Um, you can just about see the uh, London here in the centre, that's Roman London. And with the growth of London in the Middle Ages, that's between the 12th and 15th century, uh, the fringe woodland was still there. So Highgate Woods and the woods to the north that still exist now were still there. Um, and they supported much of London's trades and industry. So if you think of ch charcoal burning, most of the woodland in this area was hornbeam and oak, perfect for charcoal burning. Um, we have some of the only hornbeam um, ancient woodland um, existing in South, South England, at least. Um, tanning was massive. So, you know, if you've leather work and creating leather, you need lots of oak bark. Obviously, shipbuilding and building construction, they were, they were the main materials. Um, and um yeah uh, it, that didn't really stop until um the sort of uh, 18th century when the increased competition from coal comes in but i'll talk about that in a sec but woodlands then weren't um places to be considered to enjoy as they are now they were valued resources especially for those commoners who had the rights to gather firewood or grave livestock such as pigs they were essential um to life at that time now here's where it gets a bit more interesting for me this is the 16th century. This is Islington High Street. Um, so there's a pond in the middle here and a little enclosure that appears on later maps. But this is looking from south to north, from left to right. Um, the trees here, oh, incidentally, this is a couple of years ago, this area had the um, it was the highest level of mobile phone, phone theft in Europe. Um, I don't yeah not something aspirational in those days but yeah that's where it is now there's a few trees on here they're equidistant and i'm not really inclined to believe that they represent actual trees there would have been hedgerows and field layouts behind them they're not really represented but the trees that we would have found here were would have been the remnants from that original forest of middlesex so we're talking the 32 native trees that moved into the UK after the Ice Age. Um, and as I say, this was mostly hornbeam, oak and elm in this area. Um, we don't have, well, there's a few other trees. I mean, if you look at a horse chestnut would have been brought in by the Romans, um, but all the trees, there were no ornamental trees. All these trees were valued working trees. When I say they were working, they were providing feed um, so they were being shredded, all the lower branches stripped off, and, and the low foliage, the epicormic growth, pollarding, which I'm sure, all sure you're aware of, which is producing a crop at a higher level, um, and then coppicing, which is at ground level, producing those poles and those crops for all those industries and all those uses we talked about a minute ago. But also a massive amount on feed. Um, there was a lot of livestock in and around what well, Islington at that time, and, and limited feed. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the tree... Uh, foliage would have been used much more than it is perhaps now. This is Clerkenwell. So the road we just saw coming in from the, the right from here actually joins up just underneath here. So this is the south of the borough. This is the 17th century. So this is pre-Fire of London. Um, and this map is, I think, 1650. And um, we don't see any street trees um, that we would recognise them, but hedgerow remnants do still appear. Um, it's very interesting to note that, can you see how how linear the trees are, are plotted out? Now, at this time, we've got a lot of records um, for orchards and market gardens. So London was trying to feed itself still. So a lot of these areas here, these would have been orchards, nutteries. Um, so you would have got pear, apple, quince, damson, um, all sorts of produce being being still grown on the peripheries of London. But you're starting to see a little bit, this is Charterhouse, and uh, starting to see trees laid out. This is Moorfields, and this is one of the first pleasure gardens. Now the pleasure gardens morphed into parks at a later date during the Victorian era. So we're now, this was, Moorfields was planted, I think it was uh, 1606 to 1611. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there's an eye hospital there now. But um, yeah, you're starting to see trees laid out for, um, recreational purposes so they've moved from the, that woodland not to be really enjoyed to yeah something different the first designed landscapes appear um, they, they weren't um, 
invented in the UK, mostly came over from Paris and, and from Europe. Now we're moving quickly into the 18th century. So this is from the turn of the 18th and 19th century. It's at large scale, all of a sudden the perspective shifts and you actually get a very accurate top down. And if you overlay the, the road layouts here, they, they're pretty close, they're pretty good. And they're, so they're large scale and they're accurate. And there's no reason to believe that the trees indicated aren't actual trees in the landscape. Um, whilst they're quite uniform, you would often grow pollards at uniform equidistances on, on field boundaries to get a better crop. And that's been seen up in, there's a, there's a great landscape historian called Tom Williamson in Norfolk. And he's done a lot of work um, from this period and up to the modern times where he's gone back to field layouts and actually found some of the trees that were indicated in maps from this period. Um, again, you can't underestimate how valued those trees would have been, but still no street trees. Now, this is the view. Do you remember I, uh, I mentioned a pond and a, uh, an enclosure? So this is going back to Islington High Street. This is looking up Islington High Street. And this is 1750. Um, it's dated. And these trees look like elms or limes to me. But I, from me, I, I can see that the trees have been shredded. See, all the lower branches have been stripped off. You can even see the poor cuts and some of the stubs left. Um, there's a bit of artistic license to, to show St. Mary's in the background. Um, but we can see here, not really any street trees. Um, a couple here, perhaps. Um, yeah, uh, but I've got no reason to think that these were these trees weren't actually there. And and the reason the enclosure was there was because this was the main route for uh, livestock into central London, into Spitalfields Market. So livestock would have been held at several areas. Going up the high street, so if you go up this road here and look left, you'll see this road here. Um, and a bit further up, you see here, and Mac, I think we went to this pub. Uh, when you came to Islington last time. I can't remember the name of it now. Anyway, these buildings are all still here. And um, this is Talis's London Street Views from 1840. And now we've got the onset of industrialization. So less and less wood, more and more coal being used. And obviously with um, industrialization, you get less wood as a, as a construction material and, and for other reasons. Um, but we're starting to see street trees. Now, I've got no reason to believe that these trees weren't actually there. Why would you draw a plan and obscure some of the buildings and not others? And we also have uh, contemporaneous um, records of the retail owners, the shop owners, disliking the trees um, because they obscured their building and their advertising. Um, but also the big thing for me here, I don't know if you can see this, but the trees are not in the footpath. The trees are situated in the road, in the gutter of the road. And that is a problem as well, especially if you've got, I don't know what the fast moving traffic was at that point, probably horse and cart, um, but they weren't particularly liked. But there was a shift. Um, with industrialization came pollution. And with pollution, trees at this stage started to become seen as something beneficial for the air that we breathe. And um, so this is the first sort of inklings of trees as an environmental benefit. Um, we start to see the large plantings of London planes about this time as well. So Victoria and Bankman came a bit later, um, but those plane trees were selected uh, because of their use in Paris, not in, uh, they're called London planes, but their pollution tolerance was noted. Um, and um, yeah, that's why they were used. And we still have perhaps one or two, not street trees, but trees from that period. Uh, plane trees um, in Islington. Now quickly we move into the uh, 19th century. So by the mid 19th century we've now got the ordnance survey maps and these are genius. If you ever want to find out about trees in your area this is the trees are accurately plotted and we can start to see the Victorian layout. This is where the pond was sorry, this is the high street, this is the enclosure that we saw with the animals in. Um, it's now a park, a green and this is now a fountain. So good work's being done by uh, Victorians. Not so many street trees still. We're starting to see, you can see the formal layouts of gardens. So if there were more street trees, I'd expect them to be accurately plotted. And when we, when we look at the detail of maps from the Ordnance Survey, from sort of uh, uh, the county series from 1841, every road, railway, fence, wall, stream, building, and there's over 10 different symbols for types of woodland. So you can quite accurately see 
the, the makeup of trees and woodland in your area from these plans. And they're available, I think there's a Scottish government website where you can access all of these. Unfortunately, by the late 1890s, hedgerow timber was discontinued. But up until 1892, they would have plotted all the significant hedgerow timber on the Ordnance Survey maps. Great, great asset. By this point, the market gardens orchards have gone in Islington. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it, Islington is now pretty much urban and residential. By the end of the Victorian period, um, there is no wasteland in Islington. It's built upon. First photograph. Um, this is Highbury New Park, and I think it's early 20th century in Victorian. You've got a gas street lamp in the middle here. London plane trees uh, planted equidistantly on the footpath and managed intensively. Now, I can see here you've got little pollard heads appearing here. So they're obviously on a cycle of reduction, are quite uniform. And interesting for me here, you can see a couple of little lollipops. And these are lime trees. And these pop up all over Islington. Front garden trees from Georgian, Victorian. Um, uh, uh, developments almost always have lime trees in the front gardens and they were kept as tiny lollipops. Um, uh, growing street trees uh, has always been difficult. Um, it's not a natural environment for trees to thrive, but here we've got permeable surfaces, lots of soil, no services, no overhead cables, no CTTV, no competition for TV reception and really nice leaking drainage and leaking water pipes um, helping to get these trees going. Uh, trees that established in these times uh, got large due to the large rooting volumes that they had available. Um, you know, a, a large tree in a small rooting volume is a bonsai. Um, and trying to plant trees, especially towards the south of the borough, for me now, I'm not going to get the large canopy trees. If a large canopy tree dies for me now in, in the south of the borough, will that, if I plant another large canopy tree, will it ever reach its canopy potential? Uh, it's quite unlikely, unfortunately. Interestingly, this is kind of what it looks like now. Um, it's not the exact location. Um, I couldn't actually um, get to Islington to find that, so I had to take this off Google. But you can see a close canopy. Uh, the trees are lapsed pollards. Some of them further down are on a reduction cycle as well because of subsidence. And we manage these trees. It's one of the big avenues um, of, of trees in Islington. They cause me delight and, and an absolute headache at the same time. Just around the corner, you've got Grosvenor Avenue. This is one of the London Plains. It was planted up at the same time. This is early 21st century, I think, because of the, the, the concrete lamp column. Let's move to electric. And you can see the little lime pollards here. There's these two trees here. Trees still intensively managed. And they were throughout the Victorian period. There was, I think there was a lot more pruning than we probably thought uh, for our street trees especially. This is the same site today. So this little lime has been let go and is due to be removed because it's causing subsidence damage to that property, uh, to the front bay and to the stairs, um, which is a great shame. We, we did argue to try and put it back into a pollard. Um, and you can see the plane tree here has now escaped onto the road and is causing the same problems as they did in the 17th century. So these were left to go probably in the 70s and 80s. Um, not sure why, possibly budgets. Um, moving into the 20th century, this isn't fruit, these are tree surgeons. Um, this wasn't in Islington, but this was an indication of the, the lengths they would go to still prune trees. And this was to thin this tree, believe it or not. It wasn't to remove it or to reduce it. They were thinning it um, uh, to allow more light. So. Uh, so that's a massive amount of risk there. And I think we, I think in the, there was a lot of expertise that I think was lost in the early part of the 20th century, possibly due to the world wars. Um, but there seemed to be a dip in our boricultural practice, um, uh, which came back in the 30s. Now look at this chap, what a, what a glorious hat. I mean, health and safety is, he doesn't look very happy. I don't know if you can zoom in. He doesn't look particularly happy, but his equipment's not too bad. I mean, as an ex-tree surgeon, he's only got a sit belt, but he's got a loop of rope going up to the top of the tree with a sliding knot, uh, possibly a Swiss prusik, I'm not sure, and a fixed line here for a work positioning rope, and he would have had a bow saw. And that didn't really change. This was, photo was from 1934, and it was known as the French system. Um, and it didn't really change until we got to the 60s and 70s and, and chainsaws came in. And also... I mean, there was a lot of work going on around this period on tree diseases, but not much advancement, I don't think, in the management or pruning of trees. 
until you get to the 60s, 70s, 80s. And then it, luckily for me, I joined in the late 80s. Um, and then it really starts to, starts to build into modern arboriculture as we know it. We also get a massive influx of trees in the 20th century. Um, so um, from Japan, from the late 17th century, we're starting to see trees come in. China and the Himalayas from the 18th. Northwest America from the 18th. We're getting trees coming in, but it's kind of reached a, 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 a pace now where we have a vast palette of trees compared to that original 32. I know in Islington, we've got over 280, I think it is now, different species. And here we've got um, cherries, Japanese flowering cherries, and these are liquid ambers, uh, which we plant quite a lot in tree trees. But I am slightly concerned because we're not sure how big they're going to get. Um, but we can start to see phases of tree planting, you know, 72, uh, planted tree in 73. And, and I think now we're going through another big phase of tree planting, um, especially oh, we at least in Islington and hopefully where you are as well. Quickly through, this is the Luftwaffe aerial imagery. And just to indicate, you can see one of our linear parks here. This is uh, Colbeck um, Terrace um, and Quite a few residential street trees, can't quite see it there, but you can see it developing here, 1946. Um, still no street trees along the roads here. Um, quite a lot of bomb damage in, in Islington at the time. And that was quite quickly infilled with 60s. This is 66. So you're starting to see infill, a lot of social housing. But with that social housing comes some good green space and some good tree planting. By 81, that tree planting is filling up and you can see we're starting to get bigger trees in here now. Trees on the roundabout here where the, um, there was a V1 bomb dropped. Um, and that moves into closed canopy by 2010. So now this park is completely full of trees. So is the roundabout. And look at the volume of trees here in this residential area. This is now up to 36% uh, canopy cover. So very dense. And if you think of that the Middlesex forest was only 40%, um, it could be classified as woodland. So yeah, lots more trees. So that's the history. Sorry I moved so quickly, but um, I'm, I haven't actually run through this whole slide yet and I'm, I don't want to run over too much. So that's where we were. What do we do now? Well, I manage the 40,000 publicly owned trees within that area. So that's the street trees, the housing trees and the parks trees. Street trees nearly saturated as we've got a, a lot of street trees in now. If you go through Islington and you don't see a street tree, it's usually because we, we've tried and can't get one into that location because of underground services, um, subsidence and other constraints that we're seeing. So we're, we're getting a bit saturated. Parks completely saturated. I cannot plant any more trees in our parks. And that's for good reason. They're not woodlands. They're there for people's enjoyment. They're there for people who need open space. And in a, in a very urbanized area, open space is at a premium and highly valued as well. Housing, housing are the largest tree owner in Islington. Um, uh, our housing stock um, is under threat. Uh, we've got the, a massive um, infill program and putting it bluntly, housing is the priority in Islington, not trees. Um, so there's a lot of threat there. Also managed a team that look after the protected trees. So I've got two tree officers in planning, um, dealing with the privately protected trees and conservation areas and TPO trees. Um, roughly half of Islington is covered by conservation area which means I've got approximately 70 to 100,000 trees that are protected, which is a large volume of um, uh, protected tree applications and notifications to, to, to go through. Um, yeah, it's part of our job. We also look after the development sites. So there's a lot of development in Islington. Uh, land is at a premium and land costs are high. So there's a lot of mitigation goes on um, and that funds the bulk of our tree planting. Um, unfortunately, that's good and bad. It means I'm losing trees to fund replanting. Um, uh, but we're beefing that up. And we've got a very good policy in Islington, I, I think, for mitigation. Risk management is massive for me. Um, everything above this red line here is clay. And we've on hills as well. Um, and we're talking Victorian and uh, Georgian uh, buildings and estates with limited foundations where trees have been allowed to grow bigger than ever before. So we, I'm very fortunate to have a tree officer whose primary role is just looking at subsidence um, and insurance claims. And he's, he's very good, very fortunate to have him. Um, income generation, a big part of my job. Mac will tell you I've got nine tree officers, well, nine, a team of nine in a very small area. Um, uh, Mac will tell you I've got one per 10 trees or something. It's not quite that good. 
Um, but we do a lot of work outside of the borough. So, for example, all the trees in the city, um, we inspect all the uh, uh, planning aspects in Haringey to the borough to the north. We deal with all their planning side. So at least three of my officers are usually outside of the borough at any one time. What do I need to manage all that? Well, the first thing I need, I need to, I need knowledge. I, the, when I joined as the manager three years ago, the greater the knowledge I have on my tree stock, the better I can defend it, manage it and enhance it. And that's really important. But it, it, it was, knowledge is great. If you've got it in your head, it's still useful. But I really need that information in a format that I can present to people um, to support the management that I want to do and the protection of the trees under, under my care. Uh, and first thing I need to know is I accurately need to know on, on, at GIS level very accurately where are my trees and specifically where's the canopy cover. Um, canopy cover is the best metric, I think, to find out the state of a, 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 an area's tree stock. Um, and I need to know the geographical location, the, the distribution and the ownership of these trees um, if I'm going to, to manage them proactively. Um, I need to know their value. Um, I didn't used to like the value. I love trees. You know, um, I don't need to know that it costs, it's worth £18,000, secures half a kilo of, of carbon or, or stops £7.50 of pollution every year. I, I don't need to, I know they're beautiful and I love trees anyway. But it's not enough to know that trees are good now. Um, the people who inherently think trees are good are already on my side. I need to convince people who aren't bothered or even worse negative about trees, that trees are good and valuable and that the benefits of trees outweigh the negatives. Um, so I, I wanted to know the, the you know, the, the, the amounts of pollution interception and the amenity value, the caveat value, the capital asset value for trees, the replacement value, the uh, stormwater interception, carbon sequestration, all those values add up and they help me build a case uh, for um, better management. It helps me justify my existence to the budget holders uh, to prove what an excellent job I'm doing and my team are doing. Then the value of the asset we manage is massive considering there's only nine people doing it. Um, uh, and yeah, it helps. <coughs> Pardon me. So now I've got the evidence base. What, what do I do with that? Well, I, I want a new policy and um, we've got a, a, a policy that's, 10 years old nearly, and was cut from 164 pages to four by local inco incoming uh, MPs and councillors. So I need a new uh, policy. A lot's changed in the last 10, 20 years, with, um, especially with uh, carbon net zero and building climate change resilience. I've now <laughs> got some values. Um, I need to have that evidence so that when targets are set upon me, they're quantified and achievable and based on fact. I mean, nothing loses public trust faster than an unachievable tree planting goal, um, which builds onto trust. Um, I really feel um, we've lost a lot of trust. I mean, I'm talking from public uh, servants from tree officers. We've lost a lot of public trust in the management of trees in the UK. And I think there's a few reasons for that. Um, one is um, we've had a lot of budget cuts over the last 10 years. And while I've got some good resources in Islington, we've been focused on income generation and not community engagement. And that's something that's one of the reasons I'm able to talk to you is because that's now part of my job um, to talk to people about the benefits of trees and, and how we're going to build in Islington. Um, there's a rising awareness of the environmental and climate issues in the general population, but that kind of co coincides with uh, a, a lot of people don't feel they're an, able to change their local environment. So when they see a tree come down, for whatever reason, whether it's a good reason, well, it would be if it's an isn't I'm sure, um, uh, they're rightly angry and upset. And I need to build trust with them by showing them and proving to people that, that we, our, our policies are evidence-based and, and we're moving in the right direction. Um, yeah, it's a difficult one. I'm, I'm not sure uh, how we're going to get... Uh, we get attacked um, regularly um, on social media and people compare what we're doing to places like Sheffield, um, which is just not true. But um, trying to counter the social media attacks um, is is particularly difficult because we're not allowed to engage directly back. So having um, evidence and, uh, and a good policy helps protect ourselves. Well, ideally what I want is I want members of residents in Islington defending the tree management of Islington law so I don't have to. 
Okay, uh, better tree management. I want to be able to manage my trees better. You know, that's professional pride. I want to be able to, the forefront of innovation, driving positive change uh, and, uh, and for the multitude of benefits that trees provide for the residents of Islington, I want them to have that. And so I'm driving that forward. Asset management. I, again, I, I'm, I wasn't keen on putting uh, um, values on trees, financial values, but our budgets are being squeezed. Um, and if we don't defend our budgets by using those values um, to the bean counters, um, it's, yeah, uh, we're going to lose out. I mean, I just had a restructure dropped on me this week. Um, local authorities are, they seem in London, they seem to be going bankrupt quite quickly. So um, change is afoot. So being able to defend your service is very important. And another example is the health budget. One thing I'm looking at the moment is using this evidence to prove how beneficial trees are to people's health. The health budget doesn't get cut generally. So if I can access the health budget to um, um, by indicating showing how much I'm reducing pollution and how beneficial that is for people's health, then I'm yeah, as I say, I'm trying to access that public health funding uh, to plant trees. Risk management is massive uh, part of my job, and um, we have uh, we've had six figure claims against subsidence um so my directors don't like surprises so i not only do i need to manage the risk from subsidence by looking at uh, having the exact detail of how i'm going to manage different areas of trees um, but also i need to look at the risks to my tree stock so things like uh, ash dieback i need to know exactly how much that's going to impact me and resources having that evidence allows me to have a larger team i can put business cases together um, to request resources and to, um, again, going back to showing uh, people that we can deliver um, what we're supposed to be delivering. Okay, so moving on, how did I get that information? Well, I commissioned Treeconomics and Kenton, who will be coming up in a bit, for a tree canopy cover assessment. Um, I then got all our data, we're, we're an inventory, we run a database and we've got loads of data. So all the Islington owned trees was run through an inventory to find out how hard they're working. And then we got a planting strategy to work out where best to plant trees. We've got some added extras as well, which I'll touch on at the end. Um, but I'm just gonna go into more detail quickly on these. Um, so the canopy cover, I was amazed and very pleased. Islington has a canopy cover of 25%. So that's above the UK urban average of 17 and the London average of 21. I'm very happy with that. Um, why is it important? Well, we a climate change emergency has just been called in Islington. And one of the actions is for me to increase my canopy cover to 30% by 2050 uh, to make Islington more resilient to climate change and increase all the benefits of trees. But to do that, I need to plant trees now um, uh, it's no use planting trees in 2049 to hit those targets. So we're doing big pushes. Um, but I needed to know what I had before targets were set upon me. Um, uh, I think the previous estimates may have not been achievable. They were just, yeah, but now I can evidence base it. Every single one of these green dots is a tree. Uh, that's amazing. That's the Emirates again, as you can see, no trees there. Um, but this is our biggest park, Highbury Fields. Every single one of those dots done by Blue Sky. Um, Kenton will, I'm sure, talk about the canopy cover capture. Um, in his talk, but um, yeah, amazing level of detail. And I can break that down into ward level. Now, that's very important for me because the ward councillors hold the budgets. So I can go to them and say, oh, Bunhill, uh, you've only got 13.9% canopy cover. Off the back of this, the Bunhill ward councillors gave me 50,000 pounds to plant trees last year. And, and I'll probably, as it, it's very difficult to get trees in the, in the ground there, I'm aiming for 150 trees of that 50,000. Doesn't sound like a lot of money, um, but uh, sorry, it doesn't sound like many trees for that volume of money, but they're all going into hard surfaces and there's a lot of investigation to get those trees in. But 36% at the top there, nearly 37, that's in Hill Rise at the top here, but also in Canterbury. That, that, this was the area I showed you um, when looking at the aerial photography and um, where we've got that 36% canopy cover. And the infographic looks great, doesn't it? I mean, the, I can now get ward councillors to compete with each other. So by saying some of them, are, you know, look how lovely they're doing here. Mm, you need to plant some more trees down here. Um, it, it's having these infographics at hand from this report is brilliant. Not only does it help me get access to money um, and budgets, but also influences policy. And I wasn't, I hadn't really thought this through, but every time a new policy, uh, planning policy or any other policy is brought up in Islington and they want, inf they're desperate, infographics and detail. And I can now give them facts, figures 
and beautiful infographics that they can then just drop into their reports. They love it. And that's it raised the weight of, of trees in policy in listening to I shouldn't tell oh sorry, this was my previous um, talk of it. The iTree inventory report, well, the reason uh, I wanted this is because we're data rich. We've got loads of information captured on EasyTree. For every single one of these is a tree. Um, uh, what I can do with the inventory is break down those benefits into species and ownership, um, which is very important. So I can now go to, I can see how hard separate sizes and species are working, how much benefit that is to the tree owner or the budget holder. So I can go with, um, if highways wanted to cut my budget, I can tell them um, how hard their trees are working to the, I mean, this is the detail it goes into. I mean, it's amazing. And uh, I'm sure Kenton will touch on this, but to highlight, this is the headline figures in Islington. I've got just under 40,000 trees measured. I know what my most common species are. I know their values, 282 species that will go up to about 290 this year. But this is the important stuff for me. Pollution removal, half a million a year, eight tons. Carbon storage, 4 million. But if I look at the values here, they add up to 700,000. And can you guess what my tree pruning budget is? So around 700,000 pounds. So I can go and straight away and say, well, yeah, my tree pruning budget is 700,000 pounds a year, but the annual benefits from those trees is 700,000. Um, it, it's, it's a lovely tool to have on your belt. Tree species. Um, this is the percentage population of the tree species. So if you look um, very, an example of how I'm using this data for the management of ash and London Plain, um, we've got up here 6% of my ash, uh, sorry, six, I've got my glasses on, 6% of my facts in this Excelsior here is um, ash and we could potentially lose that in 10 years. Um, Plutonus, London Plain, another 6%, we're closely looking, we, we inspect our London Plains three times a year for Massaria, but also we're very worried about plain wilt coming in. Um, so I can flag this on my risk register. So I can now work out and show, tell my managers the percentage of tree stock that's under risk from Fraxinus, um, ash dieback, how much that would cost as a replacement cost and what that's going to impact upon my canopy cover and the, uh, the business case I've got for increasing the canopy cover and spending more on planting. So I'm going to, I can demonstrate a dip in canopy cover before it rises back up again. This is the ownership. Um, the, Yes, yeah, slightly skewed. We've got a big cemetery here somewhere. That's actually outside of Islington, but was included. But yeah, you can see the ownership here um, uh, on leaf area. Ah, oh, great stuff, isn't it? It's amazing. Um, so now I know where the trees are. I know who owns them. I know how hard they're working and I know their value. Now I need to know where I can plant more. And this is where the tree planting strategy comes in. Kent and his team did a lovely job. They based upon the pr previous two reports, specifically the canopy cover report. Um, and they overlaid areas of low canopy cover with areas of high social deprivation and within 40 meters of a road for increased pollution removal. And they removed the existing canopy cover and they tweaked it in lots of other ways that I don't understand. And that gives me a heat map of where best to plant with the red areas. Now this is hybrid again. And I love this because there's a little bit in the corner where we could plant. No, they're still not going to let me plant on the Emirates football pitch. But you can see here, residential areas, lots of canopy cover, major routes. This is where I need to be focusing. And again, this really helps me with my Budget, uh, targeting budgets and applying for budgets because I can show where I can provide the best, uh, the greatest benefits. So now I've got those. Yeah, happy days, but I want more. Um, oh, this is another thing that Kenton did for us, which is a website where you can click on the individual wards and they'll give you individual ward data. And we're looking more and more towards, um, actually, I don't think I've paid for this yet, Kenton, if you're on the line, but I, I will get you a, uh, and I will get the invoice paid. Um, so on the drop down, um, you can see the ecosystem value for trees, um, the air quality, avoided runoff, canopy cover on award level in beautiful infographics. And we're hoping to build on this and put all our TPO data and publicly owned tree data and annually publish where we're going to plant and where we've felled trees in the borough um, every year. What next? This is quick, this little bit, honestly. I'm nearly done. I didn't put my timer on, so hopefully I haven't gone too over. But I need to protect and enhance the tree stock of Islington to make it uh, to make it more climate change resilient. And I, I, I'm now being charged to get to that 30% canopy cover. And the way I'm going to do that is I need a full eye tree survey. I've got all the detail from the publicly owned trees. I need to know what's going on with the privately owned tree stock. And Kenton, I'm sure, will talk about eye tree in a second. But this is a piece of the puzzle that's missing for me. I'm not going to achieve that 30% canopy cover just by planting on public land. Um, 
So I'm going to have to do massive amounts of work with um, the public and residents to encourage private tree planting. Um, I think I can affect about 1.25% on public land, but I have to get to 5%. So, um, yeah. The next bit is look at our old inventory. Uh, we had a great idea. We've, we know what we've, we've got great historic data from our database. To get a direction of travel, we can actually put the old inventory through and find out what's changed. Um, also want, sorry, going back to that, I also want um, a, a canopy cover um, update every three years. Um, and that's to get the same reports done so I can show the direction of travel it is in line with where I think it's going to go. And that also helps me a lot because if we're going to get to 30% um, by 2050 and we're not there by 2030 or 2025, we're not showing, starting to show improvements, then um, uh, yeah, I, I can flag that. I want to use all that data to inform um, a new urban forest management plan. And we used to have tree strategies and tree policies, but an urban forest management or an urban forest master plan, we like the word master plan because it sounds like we know what we're doing more. Um, an urban forest master plan um, is not just the publicly owned trees, this is the privately owned trees. And I think we, ha we have to be able to uh, direct and enhance private tree stock as much as public tree stock in the future. So that's why it's changed from a tree strategy or a tree policy or both into a, a, an urban forest master plan. I want to expand the website. I've got to get all my data. Now I've got all this information. I want to get it all online. And that's partly to, to build trust. It's also to, for resources, it, it will help answer a lot of the questions we have about Islington Street um, and a lot of inquiries that come in. But it also shows people that we do know what we're doing and we're working hard. Um, the more information we can provide to the public, the better. I want a tree warden scheme. We don't have one. We started one. This is why I want to talk to you guys. So I may be talking to some of you at a later date because this is something we want to kick off in the next year. Um, we need help. Um, and engagement has been lacking in Islington. We focused on um, income generation. When they came to us for, hit, for cuts at the beginning of austerity, um, my boss at the time said we were going to earn money rather than take those cuts. And we've carried on doing that, but to the loss and the detriment of engagement. So I, yeah, I need to build that. Trees on buildings. I always end my talks with this. Um, I'm To hit that 30%, um, we're going to need trees on buildings. And this is where we get aspirational. Um, I managed to get one line in our new local plan that all new developments have to consider trees on buildings. We've got a very strong green roof policy, and that's going to be turned into a green, blue, and water attenuation roof. Once you have that overburden designed in, you can switch it out for soil. And I'm already pushing with housing to look at some of their new developments. All it's going to take is a, a couple of developments with trees on the buildings, and then the next iteration of the local plan will hopefully say all developers have to prove they cannot put trees on buildings. Um, and then by 2030, 2040, you know, uh, if, if we're going to be serious, I mean, look at Bosco Vertical in Italy, where they put trees all over a high rise. It can be done now. Um, the, uh, in Germany, they're doing great things with extensive roofs and with green roofs. It can be done. And I'm fortunate to be in a, in a place in Islington where land values will enable this. I know this isn't going to work in uh, um, urban areas, but this is, this is where I want to get to. Okay, thank you for listening. That's me done. Cheers. Brilliant.